Oh, ready, folks, what's going on? This is Matt here for Dark One Linux Tech and Gaming. This is the fusion of Linux technology and gaming. And we're looking at a YouTuber I generically don't listen to more because of content and really just not my thing, honestly. Um, is DT DistroTube. Uh, I've been rather indifferent on most of his tech stuff because he tends to focus more on the boss floss end of the spectrum and uh, much more the pragmatist end of the spectrum so we generically just don't coalesce when it comes to content i know he's commented on a few of my videos and stuff but generically for me personally just i just don't honestly care but this one was interesting because i know he uses like a lot of um tiling window managers and that kind of stuff so he's a very different user than i am but when he talks about new users i'm always curious to hear these kind of people talk more about how they view new users so this one has to do with software availability so i'm curious to see what his take on it is so let's roll into it one of the questions i get most frequently from new to linux users or potential new to linux users is is the software that I want to use, is it available on Linux? And this question is an important question, but this the answer to this question has changed a lot over the years as Linux has really grown, especially in popularity as far as being a desktop operating system. When I first switched to Linux, there was not that much crossover as far as Windows software and Linux software. Typically, the programs that you used on Windows only worked on Windows. And a lot of times the programs you used on Linux, they only worked on Linux. It has only really been in the last, I would say, five to 10 years, especially, where it seems like there is this growing movement to make these operating system agnostic pieces of software. And a lot of that has to do with the rise of the World Wide Web and especially web applications. Everyone now is interested in making their applications web apps. And the reason for this is because when your application is a web app, of course, it runs everywhere. Any operating system that has a web browser allows you to use something like Office 365 or Google Docs or, you know, any of that crap, you know, the web applications, right? So as long as you can get to a browser, for the most part, you're good if a lot of your workflow involves web apps and even the standalone desktop client applications. A lot of those now are being written in frameworks such as Electron. Electron allows developers to basically write an application one time and their Electron app should work on every operating system, whether it be Windows, Mac, or Linux. And so Electron gets a lot of hate because it's, you know, oh, it's in the browser. It's a browser app, uh, essentially. It's bloated, blah, blah, blah. Guys, like legit system specs have changed over the years. And now I'm not a fan of how Chromium based things tend to work, but generically, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Now, do certain apps need, you know, three gigs to run? I know there was a Linux link review for a media player that was based on Electron. And it took like two and a half gigs to run. So, I mean, there are kind of exceptions to the rules on this. But generically, like, we're getting to like 16, 32, 64. You know, we're getting into the point now where RAM standards, you know, eight used to be like super high that's like 16 has become the bare minimum if you look at consumer electronics across the board generically in that five to a thousand dollar or five hundred to a thousand dollar price range most stuff starting to ship with like 16 gigs of ram so it's kind of becoming a kind of a moot point now the os if you're on windows get or mac is a little different because of m1 and you know the m processors that they use and now they do ram but generically RAM is like that type of usage is not that big of a deal anymore. Um, and basically Electron is what Java wanted to be where Java was the whole idea was right at once and it runs everywhere kind of. So, you know, it is what it is as far as that. Um, I honestly don't care if it's Electron, if it's, you know, a QT app or a GNOME or a GTK app or insert 
framework that you want to build with here. I really don't care what he was talking about personally for me. I tend to follow much more the pragmatist route of, of this kind of stuff because realistically I do for the most part tend to be agnostic when it comes to my OS. I don't care as long as those are the apps that I need that are available. Now, I'm also open-minded enough to understand that not all my apps are going to be available on every platform. That And this is where I think sometimes we shoot ourselves in our own foot by telling people, oh, this can do what Photoshop can. This can do what X can. What we fail to realize is that there's a learning curve. And what we also fail to realize is that people have to be willing to try alternatives. We sell them as drop-in replacements. That's the problem. None of these applications, if, if they're switching applications, are drop-in replacement. They're alternatives. So if you are upfront and sell them as alternatives, and people will understand that alternative does not mean the same thing. It just means that it's similar, but there's going to be differences. Words sometimes, when trying to sell stuff, as it were, is very very important to do. So, um. Uh, I'm curious to see where he's going to keep going. So that's just my two cents on like frameworks and the kind of that stuff. And, you know, this has really changed the game, uh, especially from when I first switched to Linux. When I first switched to Linux on the desktop, it was around 2008. And there were pain points because a lot of the big applications that most people used on the desktop, especially if you were coming from Windows, things like your Microsoft Office suite, your Adobe Creative Cloud suite, even, you know, some of the web browsers you were used to using, the proprietary web browsers, you know, they didn't really have Linux clients. Now, a lot has changed. And uh, for example, obviously, the most important application on any desktop computer is the web browser. I don't know of any reasonably popular web browser that doesn't have a Linux client. I mean, everything has a Linux client, even the proprietary uh, web browsers, Chrome and Edge and Vivaldi and Opera and all of that crap. Right? All of it has a Linux port these days. And then, of course, all the free and open source browsers. All so what I would say is, as it relates to calling the, the, I know, again, this is where we have a very wide gap in how we view things. For me, I'm a Vivaldi user, and it's not because out of any loyalty to Vivaldi, it's not out of any loyalty to Firefox. For me, the way Vivaldi operates, like from a UI and interaction point of view, is more conducive to my usage than Firefox or any of the alternatives, Fire Dragon, etc., that you know, preach about, you know, privacy and caring and all the other stuff. For me, Vivaldi has come to be my default, mostly because of a lot of the stuff that they do and how they develop for Linux. While something like Opera does have a Linux client or a Linux, you know, package, whatever you want to call it, um, it doesn't seem to be Linux as first class citizen. And what I've, from what I've seen, and have used of Vivaldi, they at least do that. So if you're treating, this is where consumer point of view, free and, free and open source software point of view is, is going to be different. For me, if you're going to develop on my platform as, and treat me as a user and my platform that I choose to use as a first class citizen, you have my attention a lot more than somebody that is going to treat it like an afterthought. Just my take on it. So I don't view those proprietary applications as quote unquote crap. He does. That's just a divide in, in the way we view stuff. You know, I'm not going to slag on that. You know, have your, have your view. Do I personally fall into that? Fuck no. I hate the Richard Stallman free software only zealot mentality. I'm not saying he has that. I'm just saying he falls closer to that end than I do. I am on the very opposite end of the spectrum when it comes to my take on pragmatism versus philosophical debate. I'm much more in the, the pragmatist end of the spectrum. While the philosophical stuff matters, it just doesn't matter as much to me being a pragmatist when it comes to getting shit done. 
are available for Linux as well as Windows and Mac. So there's a lot of crossover in that regard. Now, Microsoft Office is still not available on Linux as far as the desktop Office suite. But if you're using something like Office 365, Office 365 does work on Linux. Unfortunately, Adobe still creates a lot of Windows only software or Windows and Mac only software. Adobe really doesn't want to support Linux in any way. And that's not a, a Linux problem. That's not something that the Linux community can solve. And, you know, for, for a piece of software to work on a particular operating system, the people creating that piece of software have to make it work on that operating system. So complain to Adobe. Uh, and and you, uh, many people have. We have had petitions where tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have asked Adobe to make things like Photoshop available on Linux. You know, port Photoshop over to Linux because we want it on Linux. They won't do it. They refuse to even acknowledge that Linux exists because I don't know. Right. They're, they're very anti Linux, very anti free and open source software. I, it's a company that is designed primarily around proprietary software. They're really kind of stuck in that kind of old model where even companies like Microsoft, which used to be staunchly anti-Linux, anti-free software, you know, Microsoft now has really embraced open source, right? Uh, even Google, you know, the evil empire that is Google, Google now open sources a lot of the stuff it works on. But there are some companies such as Adobe, such as Apple, that still really kind of live in that proprietary world where they, they try to basically create their walled garden of software that only works on certain pieces of hardware and certain operating systems. Unfortunately, we still do have that going on, but it is much less much less than it was when I first switched to Linux. When I first switched to Linux, it was it, it was very different. It, it was very different as far as hardware compatibility because of drivers, you know, printer drivers and video drivers and Wi-Fi drivers. You would buy pieces of hardware that half the time did not have a Linux driver and will not and could never work on Linux. That has changed. Now there's still people so for those that don't remember these times, there are a few different times. I've been using Linux on and off since 99. My full switch happened in, realistically when Valve started becoming more involved in it. And over the last few years, most of my work transitioned to being able to do just everything on Linux. So once things like OBS, once things like uh, Steam and all these other things became available, on Linux, my necessity for other OSs became much, much less. Uh, as far as like availability is, and what he's talking about in those times prior, uh, most people won't remember uh, using the Broadcom firmware cutter to get your Broadcom chipset to work. Most won't remember compiling Wintel modems. Uh, most people. <laughs> Um, the closest thing that most people will understand nowadays, and a lot of that has changed because of things like the AUR, et cetera, is when you have to install out of kernel modules into the kernel so that they work. And most of the time that comes with things like real tech and, uh, their Wi-Fi stuff, which has been maddeningly annoying having experienced that in the past. So it, it, it is a thing. And it still does happen, unfortunately, but the process to get to it is a lot easier and a lot more companies and a lot more things are baked into the kernel than they really used to be. So where we're at now is a lot, lot better. There's still room for improvement. And he brings up graphics drivers. God, install the proprietary ATI drivers back in the day. Good luck with that. Was it, uh, uh, was it FGLRX, if I remember correctly? I could be getting that wrong, but um, yeah, good luck. You'd get tear Like, if you wanted to do the desktop cube with Compaz, you would get the uh, tearing, and just, like, it, it was a bad experience. NVIDIA wasn't much better. Don't get it twisted either. Like, the, the graphics situation on Linux at that point in time, even with Intel, was not exactly stellar. So... Times have changed. Um, we, you know, we have a lot of the AMD stuff in the kernel. We have a lot of the Intel stuff in the kernel. NVIDIA is getting there. We'll poke and prod at them some more. Um, but the times have changed most definitely from even when he's talking about, which is like 2008. Uh, it's come a long way. 
Um, I don't think people realize how how far it's come, though. You know, pieces of software that do not work on Linux because they don't have a Linux driver, but it's it's very different. Now, typically, you know, I would say eight, maybe nine times out of ten when you buy whatever piece of hardware from Best Buy or Walmart or wherever you get your electronic devices, right? You know, I would say about 80% of the time now, you know, it'll probably work on Linux where at best it was a 50-50 shot, you know, 15, 16 years ago when I first switched, so... A lot has changed, but if you're thinking about switching from Windows to Linux and software availability is what is preventing you from making that choice, go ahead and, and make the jump. Because honestly, if you're ever going to switch operating systems, you're going to have to change some of the, the way you used to work. You're going to have to change pieces of software. You're going to have to change your workflow a little bit because not every operating system is the same. You're going to find pieces of software that you used on Windows that are not available on Linux. But guess what? You're going to find a lot of things, a lot of things available on Linux, fantastic pieces of software that aren't available on Windows. So it works both ways. You know, your whole life, you never used Linux. If you're, if you're a lifelong Windows user, you've spent your whole life Never knowing about all these fantastic pieces of software available on Linux. Did you ever miss them? No, you didn't know they existed, right? And it's going to be the same way when you switch to Linux from Windows. You know, you just forget Windows ever existed. You forget all that Windows software ever existed. Just put So for me, I think that's a bit naive to say that you're going to forget like all that Windows software existed because realistically, having made those jumps back and forth continuously throughout the years, you never forget what exists. And most of these new users, most are really going to be really stuck in their ways. So broadly telling people to switch, I think is disingenuous. Um, not saying it's wrong, but the person that wants to do it has to be the right mind frame and set to do it. And the understanding that, like you mentioned, that it's going to be different. There's going to be things that are available or not available. And the problem here, though, is how we sell it is when we tell them that we have to do a better job of making the jump and the pain points as little as possible by getting them on the software that is available on the platform on their current system. That's how we get the, you know, that's how we hook them as it were from a marketing perspective, because despite, you know, whether or not the OS matters and all the other stuff at the end of the day, most end users only care about getting shit done and getting what they need to out of technology. They're not technify, uh, you know, they're not technophiles. They don't care. Most people, you know, it, it's like asking people, do you care about your vehicle? Yeah, they care that it works. They don't care how it works. And that that's really a lot of the difference. And I think sometimes we really, 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 really tend to forget that because we are a niche of a niche of a niche. And it really sometimes comes across as, oh, it's easy. And it's like, it's not that easy for most normal sane people that use technology just for what it is. And they don't have a philosophical or pragmatistic point of view. They don't know what an operating system is. They don't give a shit what an operating system is. Like, really, that's what it boils down to. They want to know if they have a big blue E or a big, <laughs> you know, kind of deal. Like, uh, there are three dead trolls on a baggy skit um about the internet held desk that's what they care about so i think it's a bit disingenuous to to broadly state that these guys you know go ahead and switch and it's like if you're thinking about maybe switching systems anyway say you're looking at mac os you're already in the the sphere of looking to look at alternatives present the alternatives but let them make that decision for themselves and i think that's really what it needs and if people are locked into that adobe ecosystem that that sphere of like this is what we use it's really hard to break and people in that sphere have to be willing to learn and use and adapt and do a new workflow new time you know it's a time thing when it comes to those people 
I'm not saying Adobe has the best tools. I'm not saying Adobe has the worst tools. I'm just simply saying that for those people, that's what they know. So they hence feel that's what they need. And us telling them, oh, just switch. It's not hard. Comes across as a bit kind of um, tone deaf. Just my take, though. Just put it out of mind, right? That, that's what I do. I don't even know what the hell's available on Windows because I don't run Windows, right? I only run Linux. So I know about this fantastic world of freedom source software mainly that's available on Linux. And to be honest, it's a pretty comfortable place to be. So if you're interested in making that jump, uh, please give it a try. If, if you don't want to jump into it fully, if you jump, just don't want to jump into the deep end of the pool, try out some popular Linux distros and virtual machines. Test test drive them in a VM for a little while for a couple of weeks and see if you can get along with the software on Linux. Chances. And that right there is what I mean. Uh, like most people aren't going to know what VirtualBox or Parallels or VMware are, let alone how to set them up. Now you can say, oh, just Google it or, oh, just, you know, insert DuckDuckGo thing here and whatever private sort of browser search thing you want to use. But realistically, they're not caring. They don't care. You're talking to a crowd that wants to use and is already interested in some way, shape or form in technology if they're looking to switch. And I think that's what a lot of us tend to miss. A lot of the times and just telling them to fire up a VM or use a virtual machine is not the right way to go about it. And as much as I love like things like live USBs and being able to try it without nuking and paving the system and all that stuff, most people aren't going to want to go in and, you know, realistically want to go in and disable the secure view most of the time or mess with the BIOS or sorry, UA, UEFI stuff now, but you get the point. Most people like that's big and scary to that. A lot of those kind of people, because that's not how they are used to computing. We're used to that. We're used to breaking stuff. We're used to shit not going our way. <laughs> and for those of us that have been in it for a really long time, we're used to a lot of shit not working at one point. So uh, this is again it's this is where i disagree a lot because it this is from someone who's in that sphere all the time and it comes across as tone deaf i think sometimes to new people coming into this and how we sell it and that's where the problem is i again for me I'm much more the pragmatist. So if I'm going to make uh, someone look at Linux, they're either going to be already looking at Mac OS or they're going to, they're, that means they're open to an alternative than to what the fuck they're using now. And then what you can do is then you can ease even more pain points by getting them on the stuff that is cross-platform that is available on, a, 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 you know, the other systems, you know, Mac OS and Windows, you know, whatever that is available on Linux and Linux distros. That is how we switch them by, yes, making the OS fucking irrelevant because they don't care. They just know the pointy clicky interface and it does thing, it does magic and makes it work. That's what they care about. They're not us. And we have to start understanding that they're not us. Now, you, uh, I want more people using a more privacy focused, less, uh, let's say less, um, problematic OS is sure that are, you know, Linux based than the current offerings from, you know, Microsoft or Apple, because at least the community can go and like go its own direction. If all this over here goes the wrong fucking direction. And it has a much more open lifespan to it as opposed to the artificial limitations that we get with things like what Microsoft did with the Windows 11 requirements or perfectly usable Intel Macs now being obsolete, you know, obsolete according to Apple because of, you know, their, their switch over to ARM and M1 stuff. So... I I much prefer a Linux style base or FreeBSD style base with a, a 
without all the bullshit that comes with a uh, giant, uh, one giant corporate overlord, at least with many giant corporate overlords, if you look at the Linux Foundation and the way it works, at least with many, it's all about self-interest at that point. So they're not going to damage something that is going to affect their own interest. <laughs> so I will say that. But, and again, the community that is outside of that, outside of that organization or that structure can go do its own thing as many, many distros have shown. So again, I'm not yelling. I'm not screaming. I disagree with DT a lot on a lot of things when it comes to Linux and the approach to Linux and where I sit when it comes to Linux, because I, I think those of us that are in the bubble or those that are really deep in the bubble and on the philosophical end tend to be much more tone deaf to a lot of actual new users and what their actual needs and looking and how they view technology in general. We talk about security and concerns and all that stuff, but realistically, what do people care about? Convenience. And that's really what it boils down to. So how we sell it and convenience are the things that matter to a user. Or specifically, we sell it wrong a lot of the times and the user just doesn't care because they're more worried about the convenience of what they need. And I get it. I have no interest in gardening, but guess what? There are people that really, really fucking care about gardening. I don't, but there are those that do. So you start talking to me about it. Eyes glazed over. Don't give two shits. It's a lot of people when it comes to technology. It's a lot of people when it comes to cars. So it's a, it's a lot of people, but the people that are in that tend not to understand that sometimes. And that's where I think we do ourselves a lot of disservice. So I'm not saying fuck him. He's a moron. Blah blah. blah. He just he's on a very different end of the fucking spectrum than I am as far as when it comes to how you actually relate to and view people that use technology on a day to day. Because I have heard, I've seen, and I wanted to bash my head off a lot of stupid that I've heard in the world as it relates to people talking about technology. But at the end of the day, you realize. That's just, they think they know, but they don't know. And sometimes it's better to let them live in the delusion that they think they're right and they know, unfortunately. Even if you, but as long as you give them and understand, as long as you make a concerted effort to show that the options are there, and if they still choose that ignorance, it's on nobody but them, because the one thing Linux should be about is putting the personal back in personal computing. And sometimes we tend not to do that because we don't view personal computing outside the Linux sphere as the right way to do computing, unfortunately. And that's a, a, a tone deaf, short sighted way of viewing people and technology. I don't know. I'm right. I'm wrong. You guys know what to do. Comment, raise, subscribe, any gala Patreon. All that crap is down below, and I will catch you on the next one. Peace.